Hey everyone that's logging in, um, we'll give you about another 30 seconds or so to let everybody else get logged in here and we'll begin this webinar here shortly. Looks like there's still a few people coming in, so I'm going to wait a little bit longer yet. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Josh Vogt, publisher of Personal Fitness Professional Media. And in just a few minutes, our presenter, Carol Ann, a health and fitness entrepreneur and Fit Tours head trainer and education team leader, will begin. We'll bring you today's webinar titled Develop Your Nutritional Coaching Philosophy. Stay within your scope of practice and break through the nutrition noise. Um, however, before we begin, I'd like to cover a couple housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will be shared with everyone within probably 24 hours, you know, after today's end, um, we'll get that email out to everybody for the replay. Also at that time, we will announce the three winners of the free Fit Tour Primary Nutrition Certification Theory Application. If you are attending this webinar live today, you are already entered to win. Um, so good luck with that, and that will be announced as well in that same email. Also, we'd like to encourage any questions you might have about the presentation, and you can submit those during the webinar using the Q&A button in the navigation bar. At the end of the presentation, we will open it up for a Q&A. All right, Carol Ann, take it away. Hey, well, thank you, Josh, so much for having me, and um, thank you all so much for joining us today. I know that we have busy lives and schedules. And uh, this seems to be like a perfect opportunity to hop in on some education in between clients. And um, so I really appreciate you spending the time with me. So this is a really hot topic. It's developing or develop your nutritional coaching philosophy. And as we dive into nutrition, it's kind of a scary topic. So what I wanna do right now because we have several people on here on this webinar, which I'm super excited about. I kind of want to know who's out there. So we're going to throw a poll up here and we want to kind of find out uh, what your background, what your educational background is. So if you are a registered dietitian or if you're a certified nutritionist, a certified fitness professional, or if you have no official traditional uh, nutrition education, put that in there. Or if you have a college degree, whether it's a, a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD in some other field other than fitness and nutrition, go ahead and check all apply there. We'll do that for just like a couple more seconds here. So it's kind of interesting to see who is on this webinar. This is a very hot topic, nutrition, especially with the fitness professional. And we'll get into that in just a moment. No, All right. We'll, we'll let it run for a few more seconds. There's still people answering. Okay. All right. Couple more seconds here. We'll leave it up. We want to give you plenty of opportunity because we really want to know who is joining us today. Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and end that poll now. Okay. And so Josh is going to also share the results so everybody can see 
who's on here. All right. So we have 79% of y'all are certified fitness professionals. Fantastic. And then 47% have college degrees, whether it's a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD. Awesome. 13% have no official education in nutrition. And we do have um, seven certified nutritionists on here. So welcome, welcome. So pretty cool. That's who we have on our webinar today. Okay, Josh, thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, Karen. So as you can see, we've got a lot of certified fitness professionals on here. So that is really great um, because if you are a fitness professional and you haven't really gotten into the nutrition aspect, um, you may fall within two camps. One camp is the fitness professional that won't even touch talking nutrition to their clients because they're afraid of overstepping their scope of practice or maybe even getting sued because I think we've been pounded over the head that you can't talk nutrition with your people because they might sue you. It's not healthy for them to be talking about nutrition. Um, or then you have the other camp of a, a fitness professional or a personal trainer that will prescribe all kinds of meal plans, customized um, my, macronutrients, micronutrients, and dial it into every calorie intake with the macronutrients. Um, uh, so especially if um, you know, you've got people that are specifically laying out for their client exactly what they need to eat, then that kind of gets into who that's kind of a scary little territory. So then you've got those people out there that have um, no regard for the scope of practice at all, but you guys are probably in the third camp to say, you know what, you need a healthy lifestyle exercise, but we also need to coach our people on healthy nutrition. So how can I do that safely, legally, and effectively? So you have to learn how to develop your own philosophy when it comes to nutrition. So that's what we're going to dive into today. Um, so here we go. So the objectives that we're going to cover today, first of all, we are going to talk about the scope of practice when it comes to especially the fitness professional. What can you talk about? What should you avoid when you're talking nutrition with your clients? Also, we're going to talk about and we can't avoid it. Um, I think we're on the other end of the pandemic, but let's talk about the impact of the pandemic and what it had on weight gain. So many of you have clients that are, maybe you haven't seen them in a while because you haven't trained them because of the pandemic. And now they're coming back to you and they gained the pandemic 15. So how do we address that? What is the information about that? So we're going to cover that. Also, we're going to talk about top trendy diets that your clients will be tempted to follow. And so they may be coming to you asking you about specific diets. And so we're going to cover those, not necessarily saying that this is what you should be coaching your clients on, but just to draw awareness that they may be coming to you asking you about these trendy diets. And then when they're asking you questions, what kind of answers can you give them? And we'll cover that. And then also we're going to cover how you tool yourself to be a nutrition coach and how you can provide healthy and um, ethical information to your clients. So first of all, let's talk about the scope of practice. And when we talk about scope of practice, what should you not provide your fitness as a fitness professional? What should you not be really talking about with your clients? So I'm going to draw this picture down here to get me out of the way. And so what you should not provide is individual nutrition recommendations, or in other words, meal planning. Other than that, which is available through government guidelines and recommendations or has been developed and endorsed by a registered dietitian or physician. Now, if you're somebody's personal trainer and they're going to a registered dietitian or they got a meal plan from a physician and they've already talked it over to uh, those particular individuals, then yes, it's okay for you to go over that information with them, but it's not anything that you've developed yourself. Also, you should not provide nutritional assessment to determine nutritional needs and nutritional status and to recommend nutritional intake. 
In other words, we're really kind of focusing on, oh, well, I am going to, for lack of better terms, diagnose you with a deficiency in vitamin C. Therefore, I think you should eat more oranges. So that's pretty much what we're talking about there. Nutritional assessments. And then also you should probably avoid specific recommendations or programming for nutrient or nutritional intake, caloric intake, or specialty diets. In other words, if you are working with a client and they, this is a really touchy subject, so we're going to address it. If they are doing, for example, a bikini bodybuilding competition, I know there are trainers out there that specifically lay out caloric intake, caloric values, exactly what to eat for those competitions, but you're kind of treading on thin ice if that were to be happening. So that's really what that means. And then also you should not be providing nutritional counseling, education, or advice aimed to prevent, treat, or cure a disease or condition or other acts that may be perceived as medical nutrition therapy. So you just got to keep in mind, you are not a registered dietitian. We, unless you do operate in the, in the clinical setting, we typically do not operate in the clinical setting. So you just want to be careful when it comes to that. Recommending, prescribing, selling, or supplying nutritional supplements to clients. So be very careful uh, when you are recommending um, things of that nature. Now, I did have a question one other time when we did a webinar on nutrition about an individual represented a supplement company. I do understand there are a lot of direct sales companies that do offer shakes and healthy supplements. And so that I believe when you're getting into that territory as a fitness professional, um, you may fall under some scope within that particular company. So if that's you and if you are um, selling, for example, nutritional shakes through a particular company, check out what kind of um, protection you have with that particular company. And then also you want to uh, not provide promoting or identifying yourself as a nutritionist or a dietitian, unless you are certified nutritionist or registered dietitian, go for it. But if you are a fitness professional that has a nutrition certification, avoid the title nutritionist and dietitian. Okay, so moving on, what can you provide as a fitness professional? So what can you you do. So the first thing you can provide or you can educate your client on principles of healthy nutrition and fruit and food preparation. So cooking, how do you um, make your potatoes? Do you drizzle a lot of butter on that or do you use olive oil with your potatoes? So principles of healthy nutrition and food preparation. Food to be included in the balanced daily diet. Later on, we're going to talk about dietary guidelines for Americans. And so you can talk about what kind of foods make up a balanced daily diet. Also, essential nutrients needed by the body. You're not specifically targeting your client to say this is what you need, but maybe you can educate them on the nutrients for example, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and what they do in the body and not necessarily gearing it specifically towards them. Actions of nutrients on the body. For example, um, what do we use carbohydrates for? If we consume carbohydrates, how, does, how do carbohydrates react in the body? What do we utilize them for? And so we know as fitness professionals that carbohydrates are 60% of the body's energy. So we get a little bit more into that in, um, in our nutrition education, but just as an example, actions of nutrients in the body. And then the effects of deficiencies or excesses of nutrients. So once again, we're not saying our particular client specifically, but if they ask, a, ask us a question about deficiency or excess, what happens to the body if you have an excess amount of protein in the body? You can answer that question. You can provide that information for them. And once again, not that it's specific to them. 
how nutrient requirements vary through the life cycle. We're going to talk more about the life cycle when we talk about the, guide, the dietary guidelines for Americans later on, but you can talk about how through someone's lifespan, how the requirements or the recommendations for those nutrients change. And you may need more nutrients later on as a baby boomer or later on in life as a senior than you do right now. And information about nutrients contained in foods or supplements. So you can be factual about that. So how many carbs does a potato have? Um, how, how many proteins does a six ounce filet have? So just as a couple examples of how you can give information about nutrients in particular foods or supplements. So if you're wanting to know if you're stepping out your scope of practice within your state, every state has its own governing laws for nutrition programming. And here is a map, and this map comes from the American Nutrition Association website. There's the website right there. And um, one of my back-end people, Melissa, may even be able to type that website into the chat area. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. That way you have it um, accessible and you can click on it, copy it, paste it to your notes, whatever you need to do. But this is really good. And actually, if you've been in the fitness industry for a very long time and you are from the camp of you can't talk about nutrition with your client or else you're going to get sued or it's illegal, here's the map and it tells what your parameters are. So in the orange, and I actually live in Georgia, so I'm in the orange. It's illegal to perform individualized nutrition counseling unless licensed or exempt. Effectively, only registered dietitians are eligible for licensure. But I want to draw your attention to that word exempt. Yes, I live in Georgia. Yes, it's orange. No, I'm not a registered dietitian. However, I wrote the Secretary of State to state all of my education, my background, um, and I advocated for myself to be able to provide nutrition counseling in terms of coaching, not necessarily that I'm diagnosing, treating, or curing anything with nutrition, but I wanted to be able to speak to my clients about healthy ways of eating. And so I was actually um, accepted, exempt, from this law. And so I'm able to provide nutrition coaching. So I encourage you, if you are in one of these orange states or even in the yellow, which is also illegal to perform individualized nutrition counseling, um, there are pathways that you can become a licensed certified nutritionist or registered dietitian. Um, so they do provide that within that state, but um, that's a way that you can do things on the up and up. But look at all this green. This is very um, encouraging for all of us. So it is illegal to, for all to perform individualized nutrition counseling other than medical nutrition therapy in some states. Some states offer state licensure or state certification. So look at your state. If you're in the green, um, you know, you're, you're good to go in terms of like, you know, don't be afraid to be sued, but, 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 but you wanna make sure you have the proper education. So there is all about your scope of practice and some great information. Now we're gonna talk about the pandemic and the weight, uh, the impact on weight gain. So I did some research and I pulled up some statistics because I think um, this will be very helpful for us especially if you are wanting to get into nutrition coaching and you're branding yourself, this is really good information to use when you're reaching out for people that have maybe gained the pandemic 15. So there have been several studies that were conducted to come up with um, the statistics. And depending on what study you look at, um, people more than two in five adults, which is about 43% gained weight during the pandemic. So when I looked at several different studies, it ranged anywhere between 39 to 43% people gained weight. Of those uh, individuals, seven in 10, in other words, 71% are concerned about their weight. So that's, that's good to know because they're concerned about it. They wanna do something about it. Two of every three U.S. adults, which is 63%, plan to change up their diet this year in 2022. 
And in this study, or this was actually from a Harris poll, adults ages 18 to 44 are the most worried about the effects of the pandemic weight gain. These same adults are worried about the long-term negative health effects of the pandemic, as rightly so. And what's interesting is that these adults that um, gained the weight, um, their lives were affected more harshly. Because if you look at the age range between 18 to 44, more than likely they had children, school age, um, maybe they're working, they've got dual income in their families, or maybe they're single uh, parent household. So they're having to juggle now work. And now they've got their child at home, they're doing school out of the home. So they had a lot going on during the pandemic. And also you're staying at home, you're snacking more. Um, so there were a lot of reasons uh, because of the weight gain. So it's interesting to see that age range of 18 to 44. Now, if you want to look at a different study here, this is uh, from the Harvard Medical School. And what they did was they took 15 million patients from all over and they looked at their electronic health records. And they came up with 39% of patients gained weight during the pandemic. Now, when they looked at gaining weight, they looked at more than the 2.5 average gain weight that the, the weight that people gain on average. So they went beyond that normal 2.5 weight gain number. And so they looked at that. And so 27% gained less than 12.5 pounds. So less than 12.5, but over 2.5. 10% gained more than 12.5 pounds. And then 2% gained over 27.5. So that's just really good information. Um, we always say that, I just feel like when we're working with clients, it's always that last 10 pounds, that's the hardest to take off. So maybe you're gonna see these clients that gained less than 12.5 pounds, but they may have a difficult time getting that off. So this information came from the Harvard Medical School. Going back to the Harris poll, Here's the most popular diets that people will follow. So they ask them, okay, so now that we know that you want to uh, do something about your weight gain, this is all about nutrition. It was all about diet. It wasn't had anything to do with exercise. And so what are you going to do to take the weight off? Well, 20% said that they were gonna look at calorie counting and they're just going to probably just watch cutting back. So during the pandemic, they were home, they were snacking, they're probably eating a lot more than what they typically would. And so maybe they're just going to reduce the number of calories they're going to consume. 16% that they were going to try intermittent fasting. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. 16% said they were going to follow a low fat diet. And then 15% stated that they were going to follow a low carb diet. So just interesting to see how are these people going to handle their pandemic 15, quote unquote. So now that um, we talked about the pandemic weight gain and the impact of the, of the pandemic, your clients may be coming to you asking you about specific diets to follow. So if they were the ones that got caught up in the weight gain or not even pandemic at all, that they had already had an issue before and now they want to lose weight. Now, mind you, this webinar is not all about losing weight, okay? So this webinar is about provide, providing nutrition coaching, but the majority of the people that come to you and they want advice, um, probably 80% of them are looking to lose weight. You may have some other people that, I just wanna eat healthier, which is great. And we'll address some of that here as well. So let's talk about the first one, and this is very timely, is the immunity diet. Uh, because once again, you've got people that uh, just came through a pandemic. Some of us, some people are still lingering and they're still dealing with um, COVID, but immunity diet is huge. And so people want to look at their nutrition and they want to eat healthy and they want to build their immune system. So the next time, um, should they be around germs or a virus or anything that um, would cause them to be sick, their immune system is built up. So 
The World Health Organization, they even identified as the importance of a balanced diet to maintain a strong immune system. And that diet includes the recommendation of consuming four servings of fruits and five servings of veggies every day. Also in the immunity diet, you've got your superfoods. So you've got your vitamin C from your grapefruits to your broccoli, vitamin E from your nuts to your avocados. And other on-trend foods for the immune system boosts are elderberries, green tea, which is high in antioxidants, vitamin D from the sun, or from food like eggs and also garlic. So the immunity diet may be um, something that your clients will come to you about. And here is that information that you can help them with. Paleo is still popular. It is still trendy. Now, just because we call it trendy doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I know that we've, um, we don't want to do anything faddish or it, that's a fad, but trendy doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong or it's bad, but um, because I know I've got cheerleaders for one particular diet over here and then cheerleaders for this other diet that's completely opposite of what it says. But what we're doing here is we're just providing information uh, just in case your people ask you on what it is. So the paleo is based on the hunter-gatherer era and um, we call it the paleo diet. It, it eliminates food groups that weren't readily available before industrial farming, such as grains, dairy, sugar, legumes, and processed foods. And it instead includes vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, eggs, fish, and lean meats. Next, we have the plant-based or flexitarian. Now, this was the former vegetarian. So right now, everything is very trendy to say it's plant-based, plant-based this, plant-based that. And so the plant-powered trend is all about eating a majority, which would be 90% or more of plant-based foods but it does not exclude the free range chicken or even maybe grass fed meat. So it's very flexible. So it's not your vegan, but this is what's very trendy right now. Then on the other end, you have the carnivore diet. Now, when I saw this, that this is gaining popularity, I just, I couldn't believe it, but this is the opposite of veganism and the carnivore diet consists of only animal-based products such as meat, meat and more meat and meat plus butter and eggs. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information out there about this particular diet. One of the things though we got to keep in mind is yes, there are cheerleaders out there to say, what about this study, this study, this study. And yes, there, there are studies being conducted. There is information out there, but what we have to do is we have to look at the long-term effects of these diets. And a lot of the information um, we don't have that information in terms of long-term effects. So just keep that in mind. Also, we have the ketogenic diet. Now we have the old ketogenic diet and then we have the new ketogenic diet. So the old ketogenic diet is extremely low carbohydrates. It's high fat as well. So the goal of the diet is to maintain a state of ketosis, which means by eating fewer carbs, the body's fat burning system relies mainly on fat instead of sugar. So that was the whole concept of the old ketogenic diet. The thing about that is that it was very, very restrictive. So a lot of times people would follow, they would be very successful, lose a lot of weight, but they would find that a lot of times it would be short term. So then you had consumers of the keto, they liked the ketogenic, but they wanted to take the the, the things that they could follow and kind of tweak it a little bit. So now we have the new diet, the new keto diet, and consumers typically want higher protein, um, where the traditional keto was no more than 20% and it was higher fat. Now the new keto wants more protein and moderate fat. And the moderate fat comes from high quality sources like almonds, coconut, avocados and extremely low sugars. So no more than four grams net carbs, which is calculated as we know by taking your total carbs, you minus the fiber and minus the sugar alcohol. And so that is your, your net carbs. So that is the new keto diet that's trending right now. 
Then we have still our popular Mediterranean diet, which is good because I feel like a lot of fitness professionals can get on board with the Mediterranean diet. And it focuses on fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds, along with grains, potatoes, and lean meats, such as fish and some poultry. It does limit your sweets, the red meat and dairy products, and olive oil is the main source of fat. What I love about the Mediterranean diet is that it embraces lifestyle, the lifestyle of, of eating the Mediterranean diet, but also enjoying your friends and your family uh, when you're eating. So being, I look at this as being more mindful when you're eating, enjoying your, the people that are around you. Also, it also encourages exercise and leading a very active lifestyle. So that's the Mediterranean diet. Another trendy diet right now, or you could even say trending diet is the DASH diet. And DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So a lot of individuals who go to the doctor and they have high blood pressure or maybe heart disease, their doctors will more than likely recommend the DASH diet. Um, so this diet emphasizes low sodium, high potassium foods, such as fruits and vegetables, beans, lentils, low fat dairy products, fish, poultry, and unsalted nuts. Very important, unsalted. And it limits sweetened processed and fast foods as well as alcohol. Then this is a really cool diet. It's called the MIND diet. And it is an acronym for Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay, MIND diet. So think of it as having the Mediterranean diet, getting together with a DASH diet, and they had a baby, and now it's called the MIND diet. So this appeals to baby boomers or those that are getting into older age, our active agers. Um, it appeals to them. Um, it's really good for those um, maybe thinking that they have Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, so there's a lot of studies that support um, this type of diet and gearing towards this type of individual. So this is the Mediterranean diet with a low sodium twist. So it's mostly plant-based with a large focus on real foods like fruits, veggies, whole grains, nuts, and well-sourced wild caught fish, in addition to low fat, low sodium dairy. And the plus is, is that there's a lot of superfoods on this diet as well. And that's to promote brain health. So you've got turmeric, dark chocolate, broccoli, and omega-3s. So that is the mind diet. Then we have low FODMAP. I, I look at that and I think it says food map, but it's FODMAP. And it appeals to those who have IBS. Now, believe it or not, we have about 10 to 15% of adult Americans with IBS, but only about five to 7% have been diagnosed with IB IBS. So there's a lot of people researching out there on how they can avoid specific foods that will create this type of condition. So there are five key items that are banned from the diet that make up the word FODMAP. So you have fermentable oligosaccharides. So those are like your wheat and your legumes, disaccharides like milk and yogurt, monosaccharides like figs, honey, and most fructose containing fruits, and polyols like blackberries and leeks. Okay, raise your hand. There's a little raising hand down there. Uh, how many of y'all, when was the last time you had a leak? Okay, <laughs> when I lived in Europe, uh, I watched cooking shows and because that was the only thing that would be in English, cooking shows, and they loved their leaks. Okay, so that is the FODMAP diet. Those people who are looking for ways that they can avoid uh, a flare up with their IBS. And then lastly, we have the intermittent fasting. This is gaining a lot of popularity. And there are a lot of people that are, are successful on the intermittent fasting. And what they do when, if you've never tried it before, if you've never heard about it before, um, this focuses on when you eat, not what you eat. The reason why this diet is so popular is because it doesn't give you any specific guidelines on what to eat or what not to eat. It just 
limits your window of time of when you eat. So you're comparing your fed state with your fasted state. So you alternate periods of eating and fasting on a regular schedule. And some people only eat within a six or eight hour window each day. And then others choose to eat only one meal a day. Some even choose to eat one meal every two days. Um, but what's really important is to drink a lot of water during this time. Um, if, if an individual drinks coffee, black coffee is okay to drink during this time. It has no um, sugar or cream in it. Um, so they can drink a lot, a lot of water to stay hydrated. But there's different um, fasting techniques that one can do. If someone is just trying out the intermittent fasting the, and they, you know, they've never done this before, then they're encouraged to do a 12 hour fasting state and a 12 hour feeding state window. And then when they get comfortable with that, they can move to a 14 hour fasted state, 10 hour feeding state. Uh, window. And then the most popular one is 16 and eight, where an individual fasts for 16 hours and eats within an eight hour window. That seems to be the most popular because people, um, you're considered fasting while you're sleeping. And so people feel like they can handle that. And plus they're not restricted on what they can and cannot eat. So when they're looking at it, I look at intermittent fasting kind of like, um, for an individual who's trying to stop smoking. So uh, the longer you delay that first cigarette, uh, the less cigarettes you're going to smoke. So I look at it as this would be great for somebody who has food addiction. So the longer they uh, hold off and eating uh, for the first time that day, then the less food they're going to eat. So um, that is considered intermittent fasting. Now, one of the things that we don't really consider a trendy diet is our tried, true, and researched and stands the test of time dietary guidelines for Americans. What's really great about this is that every five years, this is updated. They want to make sure that they are up to date on the information they're providing individuals, providing people. Um, so right now we're in 2020 through 2025 guidelines. And right now they are, um, I'm actually uh, involved with providing information. And maybe some of you are also involved in, in public input and feedback on the dietary guidelines for Americans because they, they do reach out to the public and they wanna know um, the questions. They want to know, is this the right question to ask uh, in terms of developing these guidelines? So that, I thought that's, uh, that's really interesting that uh, when you look into the dietary guidelines for Americans, they are, there is a lot that goes behind it uh, when they are developing those guidelines. And because it is government-backed, you as a fitness professional can gear your clients towards this information because it is backed by evidence and it is tried and true. So you can feel confident that this information you can provide your clients. So it's put out by the U.S. Department of Agricultural, Agriculture and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which right now we're in 2020 through 2025, provides advice on what to eat and drink to meet nutrient needs, promote health, and help prevent chronic disease. This edition of the Dietary Guidelines is the first to provide guidance for healthy dietary patterns by life stage. So this one for 2022, or I'm sorry, for 2020 through 2025, this is the first time that they actually put the guidelines per life span, in other words, or per life cycle. So you have your your babies, um, you've got women who are pregnant, women who are lactating, you've got children ages, elementary school children, you have adolescents, you have young adults, you have menopause, you have active agers. So they really looked at an individual's life, that lifetime right then and there, and came up with those guidelines. Okay, you're between the ages of 60 and 70, you probably need X, Y, Z. So really look at that. Um, here's the website right here, dietaryguidelines.gov. A lot of information. And then also choosemyplate.gov. 
This uh, replaced the food guide pyramid and it's very helpful and it's very um, clear for the consumer or your client to understand. Um, and if you go to that website, there is there are there are tons of the tons of information uh, on what you can provide. You can do handouts to your clients. You can do this graph right here or this um, this icon. So if you're doing a group um, educational talks on nutrition, go to that website. It you can pull off your whole presentation right from that website. Um, but what's really cool is today is the birthday of myplate.gov. It is 11 years old today. So check that out. So I thought we need, I thought it would be apropos to put this up here because um, not only are all the trendy diets gonna be, your client's gonna ask you about, but hey, here's the information. If you wanna know what you can disseminate to your people, go to that website. So here are some popular questions that your clients may ask you. How do I start? And so rather than being very, very, very specific, then you can turn it into a coaching moment. As a matter of fact, you can take this opportunity to branch off into not only just physically training your people, but also sitting down with them one on one, having a session where you're just talking and you're coaching them. So how do I start? So you want to have an answer of or an approach of one change at a time and educate them. Look, this is, we're in this for the long haul. This is going to be a lifestyle. So let's just do this one change at a time. Educate them on the changes. You might want to start them off. Well, how's your water intake? As simple as that. What's the best diet to follow? You're going to get that a lot or you probably already have. And that you want to remain neutral. Um, I know that we have cheerleaders out there for specific diets and whatnot. So remain neutral and work with your client to match a, the appropriate approach to nutrition. Um, so remain neutral and provide solid information for them. They may come to you and go, do I need to count calories? So this is another opportunity to where, okay, um, sometimes people can get crazy about counting calories. And so if they're counting calories too much, they may miss an opportunity to miss that intuitive eating or understanding when they're hungry or when they're full, if they're just focusing on counting calories. So this would be an opportunity for you to coach on energy balance and intuitive behavior for them. Another question is, does it matter when I eat during the day? So you hear a lot, don't eat before noon, or if you eat after seven, you're just going to kill everything that you just worked for all day long. So this would be um, an opportunity for you to coach on nutrient timing and the effectiveness. Um, we have found that when you read the literature, that when you're talking about nutrient timing, and if it's just your average person that wants to lose, you know, so many pounds, let's say 10 pounds, nutrient timing is has very little effect, if any at all. It's all the other things that you want to address rather than nutrient timing. But if you have somebody that asks when and what should I eat around my workouts? So if you have an athlete um, or a fitness enthusiast that really wants to time their, um, their nutrients around their workouts, then you can coach them on nutrient timing. What is best for them to consume before and after their workouts? Should I do a detox to jumpstart my diet? Well, that's a great conversation to have. So you want to talk to them about building a lifestyle behavior rather than a quick fix. Um, or if, if a detox will help jumpstart them into a lifestyle behavior, then maybe you can talk about that. But once again, you just got to be careful on what information that you are going to provide them specifically. Should I cut out carbs? You're going to hear that a lot. Um, carbs have a bad rap right now. Um, it just, I cringe when I hear I'm cutting out carbs because people have got to understand that fruits and vegetables are carbs. So we need to change the way that we approach and say carbs. Maybe we should say, I'm going to cut out all my simple sugars. That would be a better approach. Let's just change the vernacular, the narrative and say, well, I'm not going to say I'm going to cut out my carbs. Just say I'm going to come out, I'm going to cut out processed food or simple sugars. So you want to discuss the importance of all nutrients. Carbs are important. So are fats, so are proteins. 
vitamins and minerals. So that's another opportunity for you to talk about all the nutrients. And then you will have somebody that goes, just tell me what I need to eat. Just write it out for me. Tell me exactly my portion sizes, how many calories of this am I supposed to eat? That's getting a little close to being beyond your scope of practice. So maybe you can dial them back and then once again, use your platform for education. So what is the importance of being a nutrition coach? Yes, the internet is there. It has all the information, but why are your people coming to you? If they, they have all the information at their fingertips, why are they still coming to you? And why should you have a nutrition certification? So this will create confidence in you to where you feel like, yeah, I'm, I can speak with confidence on this information and you know that you're, you're going to do your client right by not hurting them, but you're providing solid information. Also, it gives you credibility as the health and fitness professional that you have a certification in nutrition and you're providing solid information. The clients will have more trust in you if you have a nutrition certification. They feel comfortable in knowing, okay, you actually have some education in this and that you're not just some fly-by-night personal trainer that's just going to give me a meal plan. It also makes you more marketable and enables you to charge a premium and you can charge for what you're worth. You put a lot of time and money behind your education and it is time for you to be paid what you're worth. It also provides you the structure to follow when giving the client advice. Now, I know that I can speak to Fit Tour and what we provide in our nutrition certification. We literally lay out for you a 12 week program that you can follow and you can take your client through once a week. And so if you go through a specific certification, um, I can speak to Fit Tour. There may be other certifications out there that will provide that structure for you that where it becomes a lot easier for you to develop a pathway for your client. The process of achieving this credential helps the professional improve communication and coaching skills. Once again, if you go through a nutrition certification, yes, you have all the information and yes, you can just vomit all that information out on your client, but how are you communicating with your client? Do you have those skills that you can pull out the best and get that success from your client? So that's why another reason why having a nutrition certification would be great. Adding nutrition will increase the client's ch chances of being successful in their overall journey. So not only are you teaching them exercises, moving the body, but you're also teaching them about what they're putting in their bodies. That way they can maximize their exercise sessions with you and they can reach their goals a lot faster and keep it sustained too. All right, so we at FitTour just launched our nutrition certification. We have a primary and advanced nutrition certification that we just launched last month. And so the question is, yes, there are a lot of nutrition certifications out there for you to get. So why do you wanna choose FitTour? Well, FitTour, our nutrition certification is high quality. I'm so proud of what we have produced and put out there. It is backed by science and it does have uh, the evidence to support the information that is in our certification. Like I said about the trendy diets, some of them are actually pretty good. They, they uh, you know, have a balanced diet feel to them. Um, but a lot of the trendy diets out there have good studies that say, hey, this produces great results, but we have to look at the long-term effects. And so what we provide is backed by science and it's safe. It's also been reviewed and approved by a registered dietitian. And our education is accessible and convenient for all. In other words, you can take it right from your home. So it's all on demand. Once you sign up for our certification, you can go at your own pace and uh, get your education, your certification that way. It's also affordable. For those of you that are on this webinar right here, 
We have a special for you that our certifications are, the nutrition certification is $39.99 for you attending this webinar today. And I know that sounds crazy, but the reason why we make it so affordable is that we want you to get a return on your investment quickly. And we have a huge epidemic on our hands with our people in our country and even around the world also. And so we need more health and fitness professionals, nutrition coaches out there helping our people. Um, so we want you to be successful. One of the things that we pride ourselves on at Fit Tour is when we started, uh, we started at grassroots. In other words, back in the day in the late 80s, there were literally maybe three certifications you could get. And so we provided continuing education for those three certifying bodies. Um, and it wasn't until maybe the year middle of 90s, that's when we decided that we wanted to provide our own certifications. But my point is, is that we went grassroots. We went, we went to the people to provide education. And I feel like now with technology, we still have that same mission. We want you out there providing yourself an income, being uh, getting paid for what you're worth with your education. And so we want to make it affordable for you to do that. So FitTour is high quality, it is affordable, and it is accessible. So today we have an offer. Once again, it is $39.99. So if you get the primary, it's $39.99. If you get the advanced, it's $39.99 for each of those certifications. So I highly recommend that you sign up for that. I'm super proud of it and um, it's just solid information. So with that being said, you guys, that is my time. Um, I wanna thank you once again for joining me. And I see that we have a lot of chatting and a lot of Q&Aing going on. So if we have any questions, Josh, if you wanna come up and let me know if we have any questions, I will be happy to answer those for you. Yes, thank you, Carolyn. Um, let's uh, go through some questions here and uh, try to answer as many as we can. Uh, first off, you might have to flip back to the map. Um, Leslie has a question about the map and what about Washington, D.C.? I'm not sure if that was. Oh, wow, that's a good one. All right, let's take a look. Also, copy that website down um, and that way you'll have access to it all the time. Okay. Um, this map does not, unless she can tell me where Washington DC is, I can see Maryland and Virginia uh, border DC. I know that. So maybe, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, so maybe that little yellow area, I'm assuming it's going to be yellow. I would Wait, too. Hey I guys, see. I'm sorry to bump in here, but um, if you are on the website, you can do a little drop down. Um, it says select a state, and then you can drop down to District of Columbia, and it gives you a summary and all of the information um, for for each one. So the 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 map is cool looking, but the real uh, important piece is above it that you that you do the drop down, pick up your state, whether you're so you know, in Colorado, it says there are is currently no nutrition licensure practice law in Colorado. So the drop down is really is really critical. So if you can grab that link today for future use, it would be really, really helpful for you. So does DC is it yellow? Can you see it? Sorry, uh, sorry. sorry, that's okay. Um, so DC says so it doesn't like pull up the map closer. It just has a lot of stuff to read. Okay. But there is an exclusive scope of, of practice model in DC. So it's, it's pretty strict. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question would be, what do you think is the best over average diet lifestyle plan for women 55 and up? Oh, that's a good one. I'm almost there. Um, I really feel, well, I will speak personally because I'm, I'm just about there. I find that the intermittent fasting is um, 
really helpful for people in my age bracket and also the 55, I wouldn't say 55 and older, I would say kind of in the middle age area, even in like the mid forties to up to like the sixties, intermittent fasting is, is really good for that because it's not as restrictive, but also I feel like, um, foods that create a lot of bloating, that seems to be a big issue. Um, when we get into this age group, so bloating. And I would also say that if you're working with clients in that age group, look at their hormones, talk about hormones as well. Um, maybe they're going through menopause and, um, and maybe are just getting beyond menopause. See if they've talked to their doctor about their hormones and um, identify that as well. The endocrine system and diet is very tricky. All right. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, next question. What are your thoughts on fitness professionals recommending an intuitive eating approach for their clients? I think it's great. I think, I think it's really good because it really helps um, getting people in touch because, you know, we're so fast paced. So more than likely our clients are very fast paced. That's why they hired us so that they can lock in an appointment with us. Um, so I think that is a great approach, intuitive eating with your clients. That way they can slow down and really think about what they're eating and really enjoy, because we all know that when you slow down, when you're eating, it takes 20 minutes for your brain to realize that you are eating to get that signal to your stomach that you're full. So I think that is excellent. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to try and group some of these together. And then I know there's a lot of questions on the certifications as well here that I want to try to address. Um, next, thoughts on fasting for 24 hours or more? There's a lot of research to support the positives of that. Um, so I feel like that's a conversation to have with your client and also to maybe pull in their physician if they are working with the physician. But there's a lot of good uh, information to support that. It's just a matter of, can they do that? Um, I wouldn't say it would be anything long-term, um, but there's, there's good evidence out there to support it. Perfect. Um, not sure if you can answer this one or not, but dietitian or nutritionalist, same thing? No. There are, no, there are two different. So like you can be a certified nutritionist and then you can be a registered dietitian. So there's two, there, they are two different paths. Registered dietitian is a little more clinical um, than a certified nutritionist. Now I know that our certification, you would not be able to call yourself a nutritionist. Um, you could call yourself a certified nutrition coach. Perfect. All right, here's a couple questions on the certifications that I do wanna address. Um, do you have to purchase both? Obviously, I think they're asking to get the special or can we spread the special price over a week or two? Um, that is a good question for Melissa. I am assuming that you can do the link and buy the primary and then come back later and use the same link and buy the advanced. Am I yeah, I'll be honest with you guys. I'm not going to turn that link off. Okay. So the answer is yes. You can come back and get the same price for the advanced certification later on. Perfect. Does the certification include or investigate functional medicine based nutrition? No, not functional based. No, it does not um, talk about that specifically. Now what the primary does it's all theory so the primary certification talks about a little bit about what we talked about today so it talks about the scope of practice um it talks about the dietary guidelines for americans it talks about um special populations because that goes right along with what um the dietary guidelines for the american population came out with because they talked about their life cycle as well um, so we talk about also special populations um, we break down the nutrients in the primary certification. So carbohydrates, proteins, fats, all the vitamins, the function of vitamins and minerals. 
with the body. So we have seven nutrients that we talk about. Um, so that's all theory. Now in the advanced certification, we talk about the practical application. So when you have a client that comes to you, now what? What do I need to do with that client? So the intake form that you utilize with them. Um, it, it breaks down like their lifestyle and it gives you all of the pertinent information that you would need to work with that client. Also, um, it gives you a 12 week program to work with that client for 12 weeks. So it has it all mapped out for you. Now, of course, you can add your bits in there. So if that's something that you wanted to provide uh, for your clientele, you can most certainly provide that um, just as long as you're within your scope of practice. And uh, so that's what our certification covers. Also progress tracking, progress tracking, checking in with your client, giving them information, checking back in with them the next week. So it sets you up on a 12 week program with your client. You can charge whatever you want. Of course, it's gonna be all based on the market that you're in. Um, so it's pretty exciting to where, hey, I've got this program. I can just implement it with my client, pick out you know, what I'm gonna charge and you're off and running. Okay, perfect. Let me just see here if there's anything else. Do you provide intake forms through training? And what do nutritional coaches in general, in a general meaning, charge per hour? Okay, so that's a real, okay, so that's twofold. Intake forms, yes. Uh, there is an intake form in the advanced certification that you can literally copy and use as your own intake. You can put your own logo on it. Um, and it's, you know, takes into consideration, um, ask them all kinds of questions. And it gives you a lot of information so that you can design uh, the program that you're going to be working with them on. Um, and what was the second part? Oh, what should you charge? Um, comparable to what you do for your personal training. So I would charge, and, and that depends on where you live and what's marketable. So you could charge instead of your, let's say you charge $65 an hour. Um, but I would say an hour and you can gauge your client as well on if they need an hour. Sometimes 30 minutes is not enough time because if you get clients that are chatty, then you're always running over, it feels like. So I would say do 45 minute sessions and whatever you charge for personal training would be comparable to what you would charge nutrition as well. If you don't feel like you're being paid enough as a personal trainer, then, tra then charge more. So where I live, um, I would charge $85 for an hour. But that is, that's a pretty long time to spend with somebody. So you could drop it back to 45 minutes if you want, if you feel like that's enough time for you. I hope that answered your question. Yes, I think that's a, a great answer. And I also, um, there's a, varies across the country for sure. So it just really depends on where you're at currently. Um, I think we're going to have to end it there. Um, we're a little over the hour time, so I want to respect everybody's time as well. But um, again, thank you, Carol Ann, for a great and educational and informative presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today and for all your questions. Um, we hope you learned a lot of valuable information that can help you develop your nutritional coaching philosophy. Um, again, this webinar is being recorded and the on-demand link will be emailed to all registrants tomorrow. Um, so look for an email that will be coming from PFP. And we will also be announcing the winners. I know I've had a few questions about that, so I'll just address it right here. But the winners, the three winners will also be announced as well in that email. And um, they will be followed up with by a fit tour representative within about 48 hours or so to uh, make sure you go through the proper steps to get that certification. Um, so thank you again. Thank you again, Carol Ann. I appreciate it. And another wonderful webinar. Thank you everyone that attended live and uh, stay healthy and have a great rest of the day. Bye now.